Market to Market is everywhere you are. Subscribe to Market to Market on YouTube, find us on the PBS video app to stream on demand, and add our three podcasts on your favorite podcasting app. Hey everybody, it's Paul Yeager and this is the MTOM Show podcast and we are out in the field this week. Well, almost in the field. Well, wait a minute. A different kind of the way in the field means for you versus us as producers of the Market to Market TV show. And that is the topic today is covering events as we have been doing like we have for 45 years. Uh, but during the pandemic, it's been a little more challenging. So today we are going to talk about uh, some of the stories that we've been doing, uh, producer John Torpy and Colleen Bradford Krantz are going to join me about some of their work that is in progress. And Josh Bittner has a story about the Duray show that came through uh, several states last year, and he'll feature uh, some uh, crop work in Iowa as well as some trees that are being uh, replanted and the cleanup over in uh, Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Uh, but That'll be uh, in a future episode, actually coming up this week on the show, actually, uh, with Josh Bittner's story. But coming in future weeks will be John Torpy and Colleen Bradford Krantz. So you've heard them both on the podcast before talking about their work. We'll start with John Torpy and about the challenges of trying to produce content in a COVID world. And I start with what I always start with, clothes and his wardrobe. Why are you not wearing the uniform? Oh, that's a good point. You don't have the gray coat on. I can go get it. Well, you've got a hat on, so that's close. Yeah. No, have we started rolling already? We are. Yeah, we're going. I like to start okay. weird, you know. Oh, man, Speaking of weird, hard. <laughs> what is the deal with your microphone? Why are you a big time voice? Are you doing voiceover work now? <laughs> yeah. I, um. In a world. I, Yeah. When I was shopping for the Focusrite box, I saw the whole package deal, and I thought, "Man, if I could just cut audio from home, I could, I could make this work a lot easier since I could edit at home." So I got the M Audio box. Oh, you went in a different direction. See, I went to Focusrite. Yeah. You went M Audio. So what that does uh, has allowed us to sound better on our own and sound better to people who hear our Zoom calls or uh, Google video or whatever it's called now. But you certainly notice a difference now, don't you, John, when someone's not on a microphone? Um, I think the technology sped up very quickly for a lot out there. In my reporting, um, one case, one perfect example is the Iowa Renewable Fuel Summit. I did interviews with um, their keynote speakers the next day, and you could see who went out and purchased an inexpensive light, had a really good microphone, had a much better camera, really trying to bring their level of, of production value up so that they can get the viewer's attention. So. Well, in that summit alone, you could tell it was produced differently than just your basic Zoom or Google uh, software that they've put some, there's been some money. So in that sense, if we look at job creation, there's been a, a pivot for some of those people who do video production to how to make uh, camera work. Now you have, as you shook your head up and down, waiting for me to stop talking, you could tell there's a little bit of delay in some of those things because you're sharing internet with other people in the house, which everybody's been trying to, to work with that you usually have been talking to instead of sharing it in an office. Yeah, um, I've got a hard line into the work computer, but what I'm talking to you on now is my 15 year old Chromebook that I've adapted, as you'll see the picture go away a little bit, oh. with... <laughs> the cell phone wide angle lens to change the picture a little bit. So it's a little different, a little bit wider. And it gives it just a little per different perspective as a videographer. I like to change things up a little bit. And um, there are lots of little tricks like that that you can do, but yeah, you know, I'm still using a very old laptop 
that's getting the job done. The office chair I see you've you've migrated. I've I had to migrate to a, a more like an office chair. Uh, you've taken the approach. I mean, I think you had. Did you have two years, three years as a producer before COVID? Four years. I started as a full time producer with Market to Market in August of 2014. Okay. So I had you been had and producing before that, some other stories. Before that, you'd had the time out in the field shooting stories and and so you'd had time as a producer going out and shooting things. Of course it's easier to well, I'm sorry. Is it easier to do it Zoom wise with these interviews than going out to Idaho a, or Nebraska? You know, it's a double edged sword the ease and convenience of being able to get a hold of people. When I was reporting on the um, Arctic intrusion that clobbered Texas agriculture, um, in one hour, I was able to set up an interview with the Texas Ag Commissioner, the president of the Texas Farm Bureau, and the president of the Texas International Produce Association. And they were all done by the next day. I couldn't have done that if I tried to schedule a trip to Texas and trying to stay on top of the story that the whole trip would have taken a week and a half. And, and so there's an efficiency there. What the trade-off is, is the interview. As you well know, when you're having a conversation with somebody while this works, there's something about energy. There's something about body language. There's something about the exchange that, Zoom will never be able to duplicate no matter how good it is. And, and so you kind of have to give up a little bit on that. But overall, as far as a workflow goes, this has been, there have been some pluses to this, quite a few pluses. I think it's made people more aware of what their backgrounds look like on their cameras, which if we ever go back to taking a camera into their house, they'll be aware of, well, where would you like to put me? I have a light already. I have a good place set up that overlooks. And I mean, these cameras are not like what you have used for your career, but they're better than somebody on the phone or better than a written statement. Uh, I mean, I'll take it. I think audio, it's better to invest in the audio than it is for the video right now, because I think people will look past a bad video connection, but they absolutely will know when the audio stinks. You could not be more right. I agree with that a thousand percent because at the end of the day, it's content is king and people are pretty forgiving on, on video. But when, when you can't get your thought across, when you can't get your words across, that's where things really start to hurt. And that's what, motivated me to this you know it was i was frustrated trying to be able to tell a story and have it not sound well people are going to give up on that story and not learn what you're trying to tell them now i know the guys were talking friday you were not in the office for this conversation but i know you've been a part of it before uh there is something about being you as you say with someone in their office you can get the cutaways that you need of you know, John Torpy at his home office in Iowa says, you know, you can't get that unless you've already been there and shot the video. Yes, our video options are a little challenged, but if we're touching up old stories with new information, we can use some old video. We just don't get a chance to shoot or we have to kind of shoot an interview that is in the ballpark, but maybe not of the right team. Did I mix enough metaphors yeah. there? I was waiting for when you would get to the sports metaphor. That was very well done. Um, you're totally right. It has, you know, we're relying on our library quite a bit more, but it's also making me ask better questions and be a better interview person. You know, being in person's office, you know, you've got to find those, as the phrase goes, people say a lot more in between the words when they take a breath, when they take a pause and being able to read those moments in the office is great. The technology is, as it's becoming better, is allowing that to happen more and more. And, and so 
making it up on the side of just having the video to tell the rest of the story, that's, that's where it's really starting to hurt. That's where I, I think we've kind of come to grips with, come to terms with, okay, our Zoom video is this, and this is what we're just going to have to deal with. But now, you know, because of a travel ban, we can't go back out, you know, market to market can't get to everywhere we want to go and be able to tell the story as we like to. So yeah, we do have to reach back into the archives and, and, you know, mess around with a different team, a different Jersey. Yeah. Close. You're you're getting there. You you've, I have to admit, <laughs> you've been making strides to, to get into those sports references. And I appreciate it when you ask, did I use that right? Did I get that right? Yes. Yes, you did. <laughs> uh, Peter Tubbs and I were discussing Friday, how whatever group he was watching about where to look, because right now I'm looking at you in, in my screen. Right now, now I'm looking at myself. You can see a difference. But Peter had said, he goes, it's clearly some people have said, look at the camera, look above the camera, look just below it on where they should look to appear the most engaging. And I said, my gosh, just imagine if they attended our uh, weekly market to market production meetings. No one ever looks anywhere close <laughs> in those meetings. Okay. We're doing other things. It's just mostly yes, listening. It's... Yeah. What did you say, Paul? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just as obvious that you're, you're listening. Um, I, okay. You bring up the spacing aspect of the interview and yes, I can't quite see your face. Uh, so I do have to listen. I think it's forced me to listen harder, but it's also allowed me because I'm not, I've sat in front of you, John at stories and wondered what the Sam H is John shooting behind me? Does he have this as wide as I want, as tight as I want? Is this what we talked about? It, it's not you, it's all the, the camera. Or if I'm shooting for myself, is it still look right? I don't have to worry about it because I can see what I have right now. I can see that this iris, I mean, look at this. This is me sitting in front of that. That's crazy how, I mean, all some of that stuff, is gone by yeah. the wayside. Um, one of the other advantages has been in our workflow from two standpoints. One is um, we're going to record this and then I don't know how your setup is at home, but in my setup, as soon as we end this, if I was recording this, it would automatically be converted. And then I would be able to put it into all the, the watch folder at work, get it converted, to an MXF file, I can put it into the Avid, I can transcode it, and I can have my interview script already played with that afternoon. I don't have to get it back to the station. And and so those advances in the technology have really helped our workflow. And the other thing that's helped me is um, I've had to reach out and make a lot more um, connections to try and make the story work because I don't have a lot of B-roll and can't tell the story myself, I have found myself reaching out to a lot more experts and they've been able to get back to me because while they can't entertain a TV crew flying in from Iowa, they've got 15 minutes for a Zoom interview. So our reporting I think has been enriched and expanded during COVID with all the key players, the House Ag Committee, the Senate Ag Committee, USDA, um, the Ag Departments all around the country. You know, I can call the Louisiana Department of Agriculture on a first name basis, and I can do that with Texas and California and all of those places that we've had to rely on to help us tell our story. Those relationships are stronger, and I think it's going to help our story stay stronger as well. Well, and frankly, I think... Uh there is more time to get those interviews because some of the people that we want to talk to are also in demand for other things. And when you think about travel time of hopping on an airplane and getting into the airport and getting picked up and back, they have that time back now and can go virtually visit. I mean, John Roach, uh, who we actually will get in the building here in June, I think that's the plan as of now. He's like, I could do a lot more speaking engagements when I can sit in my office and I can do get more done this way and just change the link. Yes. Does he get Zoom fatigue? Probably. 
uh, this podcast, I've been able to get to a lot of places and get video. I've been trying to figure out, I was already working in January of 2020 with fellow producer Cameron McCoy about, hey, how would I best video produce this discussion? Well, camera here, camera there, camera here, and then I'm going to have to ingest and then edit and, and do some rendering and all of that stuff. Now I can just slap a banner on the top and bottom of the black bars and, you know, have a key punch that blows you up full, blows me up, full, whatever. I can conduct my own show. Does it look great? Eh. It's video content, and we hope that you're listening more than you're watching. <laughs> and at the end of the day, I think it still goes back to the rule that I've always heard. And I don't think anybody said it louder than our former boss, John Nichols, but content is king. And I agree with you. I think the viewers are more forgiving than we are in production values because we're dedicated to our craft. But at the end of the day, that content is what's going to deliver for us. I still watch um, the Cardinals post game last night. The host was in the studio. The analyst for the post game show was in his home via a computer. And I'm, that's how it was during March Madness. That's how it's going to be for a lot of people. There are some where eventually they'll be in studio, but you can save some money that way too. You also have to remember this MTOM is a podcast first with video. Our TV show is a TV show that we happen to make into a podcast and for audio. So when you hear Market Analysis or hear Market Plus, um, my 50 states project of trying to get across all 50 states, uh, Georgia last week, um, you know, before that, New Jersey, I, I'd never get to go to Georgia and New Jersey in a three month period, be a lot of travel for a, just a discussion. But for Zoom, and it's also about scheduling, and you can kind of control it. And I think the interview subject becomes more comfortable when they're sitting where they feel most comfortable. Your Congress, uh, the new chair of the House Ag Committee, do you think he's more comfortable sitting in his office talking to you than in the hallway of one of the House buildings? Oh, yeah, absolutely, because it gives them a lot more control. Now, I want to flip it back on you for a second and ask you, how has the podcast evolved and changed for the better and for the worse during, during COVID? I think it's been better just because, hey, I've got video now and I, I can have a guest from wherever and I don't have to say, could you be on the phone? I think everybody has gotten more comfortable in front of the camera and seeing themselves and taking some of that stuff because I'm afraid now there's going to be more people who think they can do what we do, which is probably right. Uh, what's <laughs> been hurt? I don't know. Um is we're finding we're going to find out how important personal one-on-one -on -one in my office is versus uh, a back and forth and exchange of ideas there'll be people in new, there's newspaper people who do interviews who email back and forth their subject and never talk to them in person man I, you that know would be difficult for me just like the radio people will sometimes do a phone and never go out tv you got to go out Otherwise, it's bad TV. You might be able to do it once. I got to get somebody on the phone while the sergeant is running around at the scene of the whatever. Okay, I can do that once, but I better get a camera there fairly soon. Yeah. All right. For sure. Uh, you have, you know, some stories coming. Um, it's just been a little bit of a change. What you've been able to do hasn't been quite what you have planned. And someday we'll get to travel outside of the state again. I think it might be yeah. sooner than oh. later. I had so many great stories lined up before the door got slammed shut on us last March. I had that um, beginning rancher story in Colorado. I had um, there were just four or five in the hopper that were just going to be just knock it out of the park stories. And now they're all just done or gone, or now there's something different. But, you know, I'm, this is a time when we're starting to regroup. And as we're getting vaccinated and things are changing again, and we're looking for those opportunities, I think for myself, I'm not going to take that for granted anymore. I think 
I used to just say, oh yeah, you know, I can find these open days and I can just go book this and I can tell, I have to tell my boss the story this way so that he'll buy it and approve it and let me go. And, and I'm going to be much more um, picky about it. And I'm going to appreciate all those times that I can get out in the field because of all the stories that had to fall to the wayside, but I'm working on some new ones. And this one that's kind of cool, this one's in Iowa. There's a Mennonite dairy that started in 2000 and a product that they produced that was available to a lot of the schools during COVID that were doing um, free and reduced meals because there was a stipulation in the CARES Act money, schools could go out and specifically buy local produce and local products. So the Urbandale School District here in the middle of Iowa found this dairy in Northeast Iowa, this small Mennonite dairy that has this amazing yogurt. And they're like, we want a lot of this to be able to put in our lunches. And it's just taken off. And so it's those stories, those little shiny moments that happened during COVID that um, I'm trying to grab a hold of to try and tell those really good stories. Um, I'm also trying to stay on top of stories. You now we're on the 11th anniversary of the you know, the deep water horizon and how that completely changed the Gulf of Mexico and how everything works down there. And, you know, those topics need to be revisited to see progress going along. And so trying to regroup and trying to play in a whole new field for how we gather stories and how we do our reporting. Normally we would do this conversation sitting in our podcast studio recording room, or I think one time you sat at your desk and I sat at mine and I've enjoyed the video to an extent, as long as the audio sounds good, it's, it's good. So when you get back onto the road, we will talk again. Thank you, John Torpy. Thank you, Paul. This has been fun. Welcome to halftime of the MTOM podcast. Hope you've enjoyed the conversation with John Torpy. Colleen Bradford Krantz is coming up in just a moment. Want to remind you, Click subscribe, like, share. I'm supposed to say all these other things. Uh, if you rate us, great. Um, but really, I just like you listening and subscribing, especially if it's on YouTube or in the regular podcast form, because then you know when we publish new episodes each and every Tuesday. Again, feedback, market to market at iowapbs.org. Colleen is really going to need your help in this session as we discuss her stories coming up on Market to Market. You've kind of always been used to working remotely, haven't you? I mean, for years? Yeah, I've worked uh, since I have my own business for part of the time. I have, yeah, I've always had my home office and, or at least for, you know, 10 years, I've been working from home part of the time. So this whole pandemic thing and change, you j it's actually saved you on commuting miles. It has. I, I saved probably, a ha well, a half hour drive each way. So, you know, saving on gas and uh fewer miles on the car. But that doesn't mean that certain things of the world haven't haven't stopped. Uh, you've already turned out uh, a couple of new stories uh, here in the last year. Uh, and you're always working. News is hard to shake. I mean, you think of things like I think a little more on the news side than, than maybe the feature side. Um, you have done lots of stories, whether it's, um, you know, court-related, document-related, uh, immigration, you name it. Right now, it's China, though, that has your attention. Yeah, I had wanted to talk about sort of what I think of as the push and pull of China, um, of the market there and the potential, um, but also some of the risks of um, working working there and interacting. Um, so yeah, so I've started digging into that story and hope to actually that's coming up just in a few weeks. So push and pull, that, that sounds like maybe something your kids are going to do with a, the tractor and maybe be somebody else's kids who you work with <laughs> at a competition that we've not forgotten in our house. I mean, uh, for hypothetically speaking, of course. Colin. Not, that, not that we're bitter about tractor pull competitions. <laughs> oh, well, what's push and pull mean? <laughs> yeah. What's push and pull mean? Are, when your kids are full grown, we'll have a rematch. There you go. Well, I, I have a good, strong feeling yours are going to win no matter what. So. <laughs> The, the push and pull I'm talking about, the, the pull is the fact that China has such a massive um, market and economic potential that I think 
um, you know, producers and agricultural businesses are smart about and recognizing they can't ignore that. You know, it's just too too big. Um, of course, the the concern being the intellectual property concerns for some businesses. It's probably not an issue everywhere, um, but it, but there's a lot of evidence that that is a legitimate concern and um, and sort of differ, different approach for operating in business um, in terms of protecting intellectual property there. I know an interview that we did uh, on this podcast with the former ambassador to China, Terry Brand, said you were kind of very curious to read the transcript. And I know I didn't probably ask enough specific questions about what you were needing, but did he tell you anything that that maybe helped you in this story? Well, I'm still going through it, but there was a lot of, you know, he has good insights just on the, you know, international business and um navigating that I think and I would love to get some specific questions with him if I get that chance but um but yeah that actually was super helpful um and and I'm you know it's there's not many people that have as much experience with as he does with um knowing China well um but also knowing the U.S. agricultural scene and the U.S. agricultural scene it needs China China right now appears to be needing the United States is is that a fair statement yeah, I think that's right. There is definitely, you could pursue other markets and probably do as well. Um, but it's just such a big singular market that it's a very efficient way. If you're if you're doing exports of any kind, um, it's, it's probably not the smartest business decision to ignore it. And that has allowed uh, some companies to refocus their efforts of where they manufacture certain things. Some uh, was done out of COVID, just supply lines stopped. Uh, we get a lot of things from China, components that go for other things. It's created quite a, uh, I won't say stir, but lack of stir, lack of action. I mean, we hear the big story about chips and the semiconductors is the big story, but this goes beyond just chips. Yeah, it's, I think that there's all kinds of components that are people are struggling to get for whether it's um, you know, farm machinery or automobiles. I was I was telling the story about the um, my sons have saved their money to try to buy mountain bikes, and they're hard to get right now because those component manufacturers have shifted elsewhere. I think, or or there's other complications that have sort of compounded. Um, it's definitely partly Chinese manufacturers, but I think there's also a lot of U.S. Um, suppliers that are struggling um, for various reasons and some really complicated, sometimes chain reaction type scenarios. You have a, a pulse on on some producers, um, more in the livestock era, uh, but plenty in the uh, row crop area. Uh, one specifically, your father. That's I'm just alluding to that in a past episode. By the way, that was I enjoyed that interview. I don't know if he enjoyed it, it in yeah, terms he, of your father. He, he wasn't sure at first, but he ended up enjoying it. And and I, I think that was uh, you know, I think you know I was a little hesitant at first to interview a family member, but what a good opportunity you know to interview your dad. It is, and now we've got that documented, and others could could hear about it, and it's prompted a, a series that I'm still pushing, and other influences, and I I have another one that uh, uh, maybe one of our analysts, and I, it was involving our analysts that I think I might do just a little tease there. Uh, when we come to part shortages, I guess what I'm trying to say is, yes, there is a a, a part that's affecting the livestock folks, but also the grain folks. I had heard about a month ago, that if you had any breakdowns this spring planting, even though you can't do it as we're taping today because of it snowing, you might have a hard time getting some of those parts. Uh, this is trickling down everywhere. Yeah, I think that I also heard, and I haven't confirmed this, so <laughs> take this with a grain of salt, but I've heard that chemical companies are struggling to get even close to the supply they're going to need for the spring. Um, I probably shouldn't cause a panic, but <laughs> I think farmers already know this. There's, I heard one stat, and again, unconfirmed right now, but it was um, someone I would trust to know that maybe one, they're getting like one out of 10 uh, as far as volume that they need for trucks coming in, um, you know, whether, yeah, for, for crop chemicals, basically. And if you're relying on chemicals to maybe kill some duratio corn that's uh, volunteered, uh, you might run into a little bit of problem. It sounds like uh, our kids could be busy uh, pulling weeds, uh, maybe going out with a corn knife and could be. Yeah, they, they might be. <laughs> uh, you're also working on uh, always a lot of court cases. There's always a couple that uh, that you're keeping an eye on or at least legal proceedings. What else do you have that uh, you're keeping tabs upon? 
Well, the, um, I, I wanted to mention the part of the work I've done on the um, China story, if that's all right, as far as who we're talking to. I had a really interesting interview that you'll hear part of in the, um, with a professor from Hofstra. And he's, it was really interesting, some of his data and things he brought up, um, you know, as far as our efficiency navigating a pandemic with the food system remaining, um, you know, affected, but largely in basically intact. Um, and you talked about some of this, I think, in your recent interviews, but the, you know, he made one point we were talking that imagine the fact that we haven't had, and I, and again, this is not double, double check, but I could not like disprove him right away. Um, but he says there's not been a famine in 20 years, which is hard to imagine having been able to say at any other point in history. You know, nowhere in the world has there been a famine in the last 20 years. Um, and he, you know, he has the data on his website. Um, so it, it's really fascinating to look at, you know, a pandemic um, not resulting in famine somewhere, somehow, um, and the efficiency of the um, of agricultural wor worldwide. Um, and, you know, the, the, so part of that story I interviewed for the China story, I interviewed um, Dave Jensen at Hawkeye Breeders, which is an Iowa company that's in livestock genetics. Uh, and they, they're pursuing that market enough um, or interested in it enough that they build a whole separate facility because of some bureaucratic rules um, in Wisconsin just to capture that market, which they think could double the, their business um, mm. in terms of exports. And they're already a huge exporter. Um, you know, they already export a lot of, you know, genetic materials worldwide. Um, but this is just such a key. Uh, then, but then the balance, I think we're going to dig into the, unless I shift to a different case, I want to dig into the, um, the old case of the seed theft that a lot of people will be familiar with involving, it was that pioneer at the time, um, now, now Corteva, but um, it's probably been 10 years now. And the man who was um, arrested was a Florida um, a legal resident living in Florida, who's a China national and you know, he spent three years in prison is out already. So he's done with his serving his time. But it's a if, if you dig through the old um, court documents, the details are fascinating. Um, you know, like the FBI out of Omaha was tailing this guy or following this guy without supposedly without him knowing for a long time to gather evidence in the case. And it's it's just funny to think about this kind of they call it industrial espionage happening here in, you know, rural Iowa and rural Illinois and a few other states. Involving a company right down the road from us. <laughs> yeah. yeah <laughs> and the, here's the one interesting bit that was in the court documents. It was the, it was actually a security guard at, well, then Pioneer, who, um, who was the one that happened to notice somebody on a tour group who looked like the man who had come through or who had, um, whose photo they had from these cases of somebody digging in fields in the middle of nowhere. Um, he happened to be sharp enough to notice this, that he looked very similar, um, used a different name and so on. But sure enough, he was correct. It was the, it was the same person. And, you know, that sort of broke the case open, I think. Those security guards are always watching. <laughs> they are. Especially on those tour groups. They see someone like you. They first are worried just about you taking video or something that you're not supposed yeah. to be doing because you're kind of crazy like that. <laughs> that's, uh, that's okay, true. so anything else on China? No, that, I think that, that covers the- And that uh, kind of bled in a little bit to the court cases. Uh, we talked about part shortages. Is there anything else that you want to cover and let the audience know that you're, well, that you're working on? Well, I, we do, I do want to work on the, um, I think Proposition 12, if I have the name right, in California, which changes um, requirements for housing or establishes um, the sort of li livestock housing in the poultry and hog industry in California. It's, I think it's a huge, um, I mean, it's a huge change that if, if um, implemented will probably affect things nationwide. I don't know if you agree with that, but we would love to talk with some producers in California. So if anyone has friends um, that can, you know, open a door there for us, we're, that's probably where we're heading next. This would be where I put it on the bottom of the screen. If you have any story tips, email them to market to market at iowapbs.org. Uh, you can, people also are emailing me now at paul.yeager at iowapbs.org, and I always appreciate that. I had a good conversation uh, with a gentleman named Russell who was telling me about how he has been listening to the podcast. So we thank those that that listen on a somewhat regular basis. Uh, some are catching up going, oh, I, I missed that one. Is 
we try to get our way around the country. And at some point, you're going to be able to get back out into the country and, and travel a little bit more. Yes, Hopefully I'm looking chase forward some to of that. these stories down. Yes. And I guess if you're getting tips from people, if they know anyone who's in that sort of subcontractor role with some of the, you know, farm machinery um, uh, manufacturers or auto manufacturers, it'd be interesting to hear from a smaller company that's making, you know, some small part um, that that can tell the sort of the why on how this all played out. And then we're going to put them in the big bright spotlight, spotlight, put them on TV over and over and over again to make a very big deal. Oh, am I not supposed to say <laughs> yeah, it that yeah. way? Is that hurt? No, it'll, be very, it'll be very low key, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> oh, am I, I'm overplaying. I'm overhyping something that I shouldn't. Oh, sorry. <laughs> that never happens. Um, we want to hear from people that are not just the official spokespeople, but people that are impacted by stories. That's why when we ask yeah. for things, we know um official channels and sound bites sound a certain way and and official stories are uh important in part of the story but the other are those that are impacted that might be more like you um than not yeah and the and sometimes it's too easy to get like secondhand information and you get the best material if you can get right to those people who are building the you know gadgets whatever mm -hmm. those would be Again, any story tips, market to market at iowapbs.org. And I'll make sure that Colleen gets them unless she wants to give her email out as well. Yeah, I'm fine with that. It's Colleen.France, that's K-R-A-N-T-Z at iowapbs.org. All right, we'll put your email up as well. All right, Colleen, thank you. All right, thanks a lot. A reminder, if you have any feedback, hit me up, paul.yeager at iowapbs.org or the show, Market to Market, at iowapbs.org. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you all so very much for watching and listening. We appreciate it.